All right, let's get started with lesson four, measurements, part two. Part two is just a continuation of looking at measurements and the SI uh, system that we use in chemistry. Um, let's go ahead and define length. Length is the distance of an object. The SI fundamental unit of length, as we talked about in um, the first part of this lesson, is the meter which you should be very familiar with. All right, let's look at mass now. Mass, by definition, is a measure of the resistance of an object to the change in its state of motion or the amount of material an object has, okay? So when you say something has mass, we're really talking about how much does it resist a change in its actual motion state of motion. So if an object has a lot of mass, it's going to be harder for that object to change its state of motion. Where you can also look at the fact that mass um, includes the amount of material that an object has. The SI unit for mass is the kilogram, which we learned also in part one of this lesson. And roughly, you can think of is that one kilogram is equal to about 2.2 pounds. Um, so we can essentially write one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds. All right. Um, now, although we use the kilogram as the SI unit, in chemistry, the gram or the milligram is going to be our unit of choice. So if they ask you on the test, what is the fundamental SI unit of mass, you still have to state the kilogram. But we are going to use the gram and the milligram in chemistry because we're dealing with very small quantities of materials um, when it comes to chemistry and not really big, large amounts like you would see at the kilogram level. Now, is there a difference between mass and weight? And the answer is absolutely. So in terms of weight, um, your weight, your mass can't change, all right, when, regardless of your location. So uh, you, you have the same amount of mass as you would here on Earth as you do on the moon. However, your weight changes. And why does your weight change? Is because weight is determined by the gravitational pull, all right? The, the more gravity that's pulling on your body, the more weight you actually have, all right? So mass is universal. It doesn't matter where you're at. Um, you have the same mass, but weight is completely dependent upon the amount of gravitational pull that exists. All right, so what about volume? Now, remember from part one, we said that there is no fundamental SI unit for volume at all. And so the, the volume unit for the SI system must be derived. And we're going to talk about how we do that in just a minute. But how do we define volume? Volume refers to the amount of space that is occupied by a substance. All right? Volume can be thought of as being three dimension three-dimensional. When you talk about space, there has to be three dimensions involved. And that's why in your math class, you learn that when you find the volume of a cube, for instance, you take the um, length, oops, let me use a, you take the length times the width times the height, and that gives you the volume. Because volume, again, is three dimensions, so you have to have three to, uh, length, width, and height there, okay? Um, the, how do we get the fundamental, or how do we get a derived unit um, for volume? Well, it comes out of using length, all right? And that, that's kind of the key central idea, is that volume is derived from the unit of length. And we know that um, we use meter for the fundamental SI unit of length, 
Therefore, the meter is going to be the way in how we're going to help derive volume here. Okay, so let's say that we have a, a cube as depicted in this diagram. And if we take this top cube and we measure the length across, we would find that we have one meter. And if we look at the width, this would be also one meter. And the height of this cube is one meter. All right. So if we plug that into our equation and we go one meter times one meter times one meter, we end up getting one cubic meter, okay, as our unit. And it turns out that this is how we're going to derive the SI unit for volume, is through a cube that is one meter in length, one meter in width, and one meter in height. So in other words, what we're saying is, is that the vo unit for volume for in the SI system is going to be the cubic meter, all right? So on the test or quiz, when they ask you, how do we derive um, volume? You're gonna say that basically, or write that it's based on the unit of length, the meter. And it is found by taking a cube that is one meter in length, one meter in width, and one meter in height, and, and plug that into our equation, one times one times one, and you get one cubic meter. So therefore, the SI unit for volume is going to be the cubic meter, all right? Now, the cubic meter is very large. It's, it's a, an extremely large volume, uh, too large of a volume for the work that we do in chemistry. So we're going to scale that down a little bit. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take our cubic meter, or one cubic meter in size, which is uh, this right here, and we're going to divide that into 1,000 um, cubes, basically. Okay, 1,000 cubes. And then we're going to take one of those cubes out, and it's going to have the dimensions of length, width, and height as a cu cubic decimeter, okay? So when you take one decimeter times one decimeter times one decimeter, and that's going to equal to one cubic decimeter, all right? So that's the length, width, and height of one of these cubes when you divide a cubic meter into a thousand cubes, all right? So a cubic decimeter is more realistic to use in chemistry. Um, what it is related to is the liter, and you're probably more familiar with if using the liter than the cubic decimeter. And so in this class, we're going to make that interchangeable. So what we're going to say, let me erase this. What we're going to say is we can interchange one cubic decimeter for one liter. It has the same proportions, one-to-one -one ratio. So we can convert back and forth between cubic decimeters and one liter. Now, we can further take our cubic decimeter and divide it into another thousand cubes. And when we do that and take one of those cubes out, what we get is a cube that is one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. So we have one centimeter times a centimeter times a centimeter, and that gives us a cubic centimeter. And it turns out that a cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter. So this is a very, very teeny volume. However, in chemistry, it's very practical to use um, milliliters um, or cubic centimeters instead of cubic meters. All right? So the bottom line, in chemistry, there's a couple things you need to, to, to understand about volume. Number one is that volume is, the, the SI unit for volume is derived from the meter length. And the SI unit for volume is the cubic meter. However, in chemistry, 
we often use the cubic decimeter and liter or the cubic centimeter and the milliliter um, because they're easier volumes to deal with at such small scales that we have, okay? So I'm gonna write that out for you. Again, one cubic decimeter is equal to one liter and one cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter. And these right here, relationships, you need to know really well. All right? And that's all I want to talk about volume at this point. All right, so now let's turn our attention to temperature. All right? There are essentially three temperature scales, all right, that you need to be aware of. Celsius, Kelvin, and Fahrenheit, all right? So let's define temperature first, and then we'll get into those three scales. Um, temperature is defined um, as a measurement of how hot or cold an object is. Now, later on in the year, we'll get into uh, more specifics about temperature and what this truly means, all right? But temperature um, always determines the direction of heat flow, and heat is a form of energy that is transferred from one object to another. Essentially, heat is energy that always will move or flow from a warm to a cold object, all right? The object that is the coldest, obviously, has the lower temperature, and an object that is super hot has the highest temperature, and these things you're familiar with, but we'll get into more specifics later on about temperature. All right, so let's go back to our temperature scales now. So we have the Celsius scale, and we have the Kelvin scale. Those two scales are going to be the primary scales that we're going to use in chemistry. Fahrenheit. This is about the only time we're really going to discuss Fahrenheit, and that is we're really not going to use it. So don't worry about it, all right? Um, Fahrenheit is just something that we don't really use much in chemistry. Um, it's not a very good scale, so we ignore it. So this is about all I'm ever going to say about Fahrenheit. So we're going to keep to Celsius and Kelvin, okay? So how is the Celsius scale based on, all right? And you need to know this for the quiz and test. The Celsius scale is going to be based on water's freezing point at zero degrees C and the boiling point of water, at, which is 100 degrees C, and this takes place at sea level. Now, the key is sea level here. Now, you need to make sure you include that on your quizzes and tests. Now, a lot of students will leave that off, but you just simply can't say that Celsius is based on water's freezing and boiling points because the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water can change based on the elevation, especially the boiling point. So the boiling point at sea level is 100 degrees C, and the freezing point is 0 degrees C. So you must address um, both those freezing point, boiling point, as well as the sea level, all right? Now the Kelvin scale is a little different, okay? The Kelvin scale, which is often called the absolute temperature, right? Absolute temperature scale. Um, the Kelvin scale, uh, first of all, Kelvin is the SI unit for temperature. Um, Kelvin is going to be based on what we call absolute zero, all right? Now, absolute zero simply means that there is no kinetic energy um, in an object. So in other words, there is no motion. Now remember when we uh, expressed the three states of matter and we said that uh, gases, solids, and liquids all have kinetic energy and they all have motion. Um, even solids have some kinetic energy that allows them to have vibrational motion. But at absolute zero, we have absolutely no kinetic energy, so therefore, particles have absolutely no motion, all right? So that is considered our zero point, or our zero Kelvin, is at absolute zero, all right? This turns out to be minus 273.15 degrees C. 
So we just said that um, at sea level, water freezes at zero degrees C. So even though water is frozen and it's really cold, it still has a lot of kinetic energy. And so the particles, the water molecules that make up the ice still, even though they're in the solid form, still have kinetic energy and they're having that vibrational motion. We would have to drop water's temperature down another 273.15 degrees Celsius in order to reach absolute zero. So absolute zero is very, very, very cold, all right? So we can look at the, the scales. Again, we have the Kelvin scale here, but we're not going to talk about it at, um, at all. So let's just focus on the Celsius scale. So um, here's the 100 degrees part where water will boil. Here is the zero degrees where water freezes at sea level. And you can see that it corresponds to the Kelvin scale here um, at ne negative or at, at 273 Kelvin is um, zero degrees Celsius. So we can say at 273 Kelvin would equal zero degrees C in relationship. And at the boiling point of water, we have 373 Kelvin is equal to 100 degrees C. And so that's what our temperature scale is based on. So down here is zero Kelvin where we have absolutely no reading on the temperature scale because there's absolutely no kinetic energy at zero Kelvin, all right? So again, the, the Kelvin scale and the Celsius scale here, we're gonna use the Fahrenheit scale, we're just going to ignore, all right? So in order to be able to convert back between Celsius and Kelvin, we have a, an equation. And this equation I want you to memorize. So come to class, um, having this down packed, all right? So Kelvin is equal to whatever the degree Celsius is plus 273.15. So it's very simple to use. So let's give you an example. Say we take and measure, say we have an object here and we put in a thermometer. We'll just say this is our thermometer and it reads 25 degrees C. All right, and we want to convert that temperature into Kelvin. So all we have to do is use this equation. Kelvin is equal to 25 degrees C plus 273.15. Oops, and we add those numbers together and we should get 298.15 K. All right, um, and that's all there is to it. Now, sometimes you'll have to convert Kelvin back into Celsius. So you would just take your um, Kelvin and subtract 273.15, and that will give you your Celsius, okay? So easy equation, you just need to memorize it. Um, this equation is going to be more useful when we get um, later on into the year, um, but it's a nifty equation to have down now. All right, well, um, that's all I have for this particular lecture video. So make sure you study um, these notes really well and prepare for the quiz and test over it. And that's it.